look to you for everything that we possess. Oh God, you're the, you're the God above all gods. We exalt your name today. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. We come to bless your holy name and we declare the greatest anointing to fall in this house. Touch those that are watching my live stream. Let someone, we declare, will be saved today, healed today, delivered today. And for that, we give you praise and we're bringing you worship. Put your hands together and magnify God. Let's have church. Oh, good morning, harvest time. Ready to praise God? Amen. Oh, there's no other name like Him. Amen. I can already feel the Holy Spirit moving in this place.
love your name. His name is Jesus. Your name is Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, right now, you want to come, 
you ought to stand and say, for God I live, and for God I die, I declare He is He. Come on, come on, come on and say about it. Give Him your best. And who can stop the Lord? He's awesome. And who can stop the Lord? And who you are, who you are. 
Say, Lord, where are you at? And I know there's many times that when every one of y'all has said the same thing. Where are you, Lord? I seek you every day and I don't hear from you anymore. But hold on to that promise. Just hold on to that promise because God is real. God is real. His promise never fails. Oh, Lord. Because you are a good, good father, Lord. Because who you are. And who you are. And who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Jesus. 
Amen. How about that word from Brother Frank, huh? I just want to piggyback off what Brother Frank was saying right there, man. Just for all the fathers out there today. Man, it's been a kudos to all you guys. I'm a father as well, but man, it's for all you guys that have been out there struggling and, and you know, making ends meet and making sure your family's taken care of. You know, you don't even see your family half the time during the week. You just look forward for that Saturday or that Sunday. Or those 30 minutes in between just to come home and see your babies asleep in your bed, you know, because you've just been working, busting your tail, put food on the table. So, um, we love you guys. You know what I mean? Just appreciate all the fathers out there. So, I just want to send you this little blessing. Just, uh, it was something a little unexpected for you guys just to close this uh, worship. Set the atmosphere a little bit better for Pastor Lee's coming with a powerful word for all you guys. For all you fathers out there, happy Father's Day. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, you're, uh, you're not going unrecognized. This day is just for you. So just worship. Just a few more seconds. Happy Father's Day, guys.
just worship in church. Just feel the presence. Everything you have today, just lay it down at his feet. Just worship him deeply. Speak to him. He's listening. He's here right now, church. He loves you. We love you. Harvest time, just worship. Just let him move in this place. Listen to that part of Amen. things that you're going to be doing in our lives. I speak love and faith and endurance and strength into every single one of these, every one of your children here today. For all the fathers, for all the fathers that have gone to be with you, Lord, Look for the little bit of pain that sticks behind for those who don't have a father, that they have a father in you, and you're the greatest father of all. Amen.
Psalms. I have never preached from this passage, 128, Psalms 128, but I also want to go to Ephesians chapter 5, where it talks about husbands to love their wives and talks about the family real quick, and then we'll begin. But here's, here's Psalms 128. If you're there, say amen. If you're not there, say, wait on me, Pastor. <laughs> okay. Psalms 128. Hallelujah. Psalms 128, verse 1 through 6. Here's what it should read. Blessed is everyone. Somebody say, I'm blessed. That feareth the Lord and that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Now this is the blessing on the house of a God-fearing man or woman. But it really speaks to the man, the father. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy thou shalt be, and it shall be well with thee. Verse 3 Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, and thy children like olive plants or trees. One translation said, sitting around thy table. Then it says, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Now it goes prophetic because it says the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. But don't forget, that's where the temple of the Lord is. That's where the presence of God resides. So spiritually speaking, uh, God will bless you from the throne room of heaven. Say amen. Then it goes on to say, uh, thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem or his people, we're his people, all the days of thy life. Last verse, yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel or God's people. Now, Ephesians chapter 5 King James Version it's on page 1335 here's what it's going to read as I take off in verse 25, 26 and 27 Ephesians 5 25 through 27 talking to husbands husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Last verse, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Somebody say a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Shall we pray? Father, anoint lips of clay. Father, this is a good word. We're believing before we leave here today that we will understand that we must take on the nature of you, our Heavenly Father. All the men of this house that are fathers are going to be fathers. They need at least these five characteristics we're going to talk about. Father, I'm praying today that a change will take place in their heart, mind, and spirit. And before we leave here today, and those that are watching live stream, someone will devour this word and gospel of the truth and they will be saved, healed, delivered and transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. We declare greatness today and everybody said amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can we honor God's word today with another praise offering? The word is God. I said the word is God and God is his word okay so my introduction says happy Father's Day and we have a gift for you I believe it's out front isn't that right Louie okay and how much is that ten dollars a piece no no it's free somebody shout free I, I read that passage and uh uh, I want to declare to you just out of that passage, and it's an whole, another message. Uh, you must realize as fathers, I'm speaking to the fathers today, that we must have, we must give attention to our faith. And, and that, that means we must be saved. How many knows you must be born again? Come on. To receive the blessings of God, a man of God, 
Or a man, to become a man of God, must be saved. Okay, and then it speaks to us that we need to give attention to our family. We, we read about children and a wife there. How many men today would give God praise for your family, your family? Come on, you celebrate your family. And, and then the last thing in that passage would be, it, it, it gives it, we ought to give attention to our future. And it's just not our future in our everyday walk, but we need to be concerned to give attention or invest in the future of our children and grandchildren. Can all the women say amen? And their wives. Because your wives are usually the byproduct of what you made them to become. Did you understand that? I said your wives are usually the byproduct of what you made them become. Now, we're having a little trouble on the sound there, but don't worry. It's no one knocking at the door but Jesus. Now, understand this, that as I begin to look at this, I realize we, we're, we're, we need to give attention to salvation, responsibility, and our destination. Our greatest destination is to shun the very place called hell and run a race of faith because we're trying to win people to God and the kingdom, but we're headed to heaven. Shout amen. So uh, uh, Father's Day, I, I remind all the fathers, and you got to get this, we actually, though it's a great day, Brother Ernest, we take second place. That's right. We're, we're in second place on this very special day. Faith knows where I'm going. The biggest day is not Father's Day. The biggest day is Mother's Day. And all the women, put your hands together and give yourself a praise. Now you say, Pastor, why is that? Because uh, statistics are 72%, if not 78, of Americans plan to celebrate Father's Day. Think about that. It's over two-thirds. They're celebrating today. I had somebody call me early and say, we won't be there today. We're going to the lake. Come on, pray for that person. That's all right. I'm, uh, birthdays and all that. 81.8% uh, celebrate Mother's Day. Hmm. A little more, close to 90% celebrate mother. 74.3% of consumers say they will buy dad a greeting card. That ain't my son. That ain't my daughter, but somebody's just going to get a card. Come on. My son done told me my, my, my check's in the mail. Come on now. He texted me this morning and said, Dad, I done sent you a present. He'll be there in a day or two. Can't tell you what it's about, but it's going to be good. Somebody say, thank God for pastor's gift. Okay, so watch this. So then I go on to say that they're going to get a good, but 36% but will buy a necktie. Mm, that's not bad. 41.6% plan a special outing with dad. Watch this. $8 billion will be spent on fathers or more. But eight. But $10.43 billion will be spent on mothers. What's up with these mothers? Come on. The average cost of a father's day gift is $42. The average cost of a mother's gift is $78. Come on now. Dads, let me tell you, we don't get a whole lot of respect. Now, you know that, don't you? Okay, let me move on. You see, we're more understanding the importance of father in the family. And it's, it's made clear in the Bible that God's ideal family is for there to be a godly mother and also there's to be a godly father. And, and that's the way God designed marriage. According to the Bible, marriage is to be a union. Somebody shout yes. Between, what's this, a man and a woman. And it's the ideal family that God intends. It's all throughout scripture. There will be a mother and a father for those children. And so as I move further, you find that the Bible, when you look at it, there are many stories of fathers that were good fathers, but then there were a lot of fathers who were bad fathers. As a matter of fact, I, even, I haven't got time to go there, but David was a success. King David was a success as a king. 
The Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. He was the apple of God's eye. The anointing of God was upon him. But all I can tell you is, though he was a great king and a great warrior for Israel, he failed many times as a great father. Am I right about it? So, according to a census bureau, and I looked this up yesterday, Google, come on somebody, 19.7 million children, yes, more than one in four children live without a father in the home. Sons and daughters are affected. How many believe that when there's not a father? So I got 10 quick things before I go on to the message. Four times greater risk of poverty. That child without a father has four times a greater risk to never know the blessings of God. Seven times more likely to become a young lady. His daughter will become pregnant as a teenager. Seven times greater without a father in the home. Two times more likely to suffer obesity. Eat because they're oppressed and depressed. Uh, they're more likely to have behavioral problems. Angry. Can't get along with nobody. In school, out of school. Just, just, just really messes their mind up. Uh, they're more likely to face abuse and neglect. Can you imagine the father that's not in the home because he left or didn't stick around? That now there's another man in the home and who knows what's going on there, especially if he's not a godly man. So then they're usually abused and neglected. And then there's there, number six, two times greater to develop health problems. I never thought that. They, 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 have, they have health problems tw twice as much uh, if, if the father's not in the home. And then they're two times likely to drop out of school. And number eight, they're more likely to become addicted to drugs and alcohol. How many know somebody didn't have a father that went those directions? Come on. Here's the last two. They're more likely to commit a crime or suicide. They're more likely to go to prison. Should I say any more? So with all that being said, the five characteristics of a great father, and it's right now 1153 and I have an appointment so I can't stay long. It's Father's Day. So five quick characteristics. One is a good father or a great father, he is a protector. Somebody say he's a protector. The father is protected because he is concerned about you. That's right. You're his son or daughter and he's, he's concerned about you. He might even get on your nerves. Come on now. As a matter of fact, uh, if he's a real father, I've heard this, you've heard this. He'll often ask you, uh, where are you at? Son, where you at? Have you ever, mom and dad, dad come on, where you at? Uh, you know, the one thing about my wife when we were raising our kids, the two boys and the daughter, anytime Darren was somewhere and it was quiet, that meant danger. <laughs> we had to find that boy. One time I found him hanging on the outside of my window at about 12 because he slipped out and swam and we didn't know it. He climbed down off the roof. I'm telling on you, son, right there. And I was taken up for him in the kitchen. Me and my wife were just having a conversation about Darren and his character. And there he was out there. He was a good boy, but I mean, you had to watch him. He's a little mischief. And he was out there. And I go to the bathroom, and there I see a pair of hands hanging on my windowsill. Turn the light on. I was ready to get a gun. And then I recognized those hands. I said, that looks like my son's hands. Sure enough. I looked at him, he was hanging. I left him hanging too. I said, boy, what you doing? What are you doing? I'm defending him now. What are you doing? Uh, Dad, uh, uh, me, and, me and Justin went swimming. I said, get in here. Now I'll tell you the next story later. But long story short, you know, he's always, a good father's always going to know where you're at. It's just like when God in Genesis 3 and 8, he says, Adam, where art thou? God didn't ask him where he was because he didn't know. He was wanting Adam to admit, come on, and fess up to what he did and where he was at. And come out of hiding. Come on, shout amen. 
So you got to realize that, that uh, uh, th there'll be nervous questions that your father might ask. And one is, one was this, where are you going? Now, my, my daddy always said, where do you think you're going? Anybody had a daddy like that? What do you, son, son, what do you think you're going? And I said, well, uh, dad, uh, oh, y'all know. And, and so uh, uh, then, then they'll, they'll ask that question, well, when you going to be home? Now, do I have any young ladies in the house that you had a mother or daddy asking that? When you going to be home? I remember the first time they said 8 o'clock. And I'm thinking it's 7. I got to be home at 8. Oh, yeah. Man, it was strict around my house. So you got to understand that, that uh, my daddy was old school. He, he never did say when you're going to be home. He always said, you will be home at this time. Come on, give God praise for daddies. Come on. Yeah. We're talking about their protectors. Great fathers, I wrote down, possess accountability. That's right. In their character. A, good, a great father, he'll have, he will have accountability. And, and, and he will teach their sons and daughters the same. Proverbs 22, 6 says, watch this, train up a child in, in, in the way he should go. One translation says, train up a child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. In other words, in, the, in nature and in the character of God. That's right. And when, when he is old, he will not depart. Now, I got news for you. They don't all wait till they're old. I'm telling you, uh, many of them that are smart kids. Did anybody here got any smart kids? Come on. Got a dumb phone, smartphone. You got to have a smart kid. Smart kids will catch, will, will get it. They'll catch on quick. <laughs> oh, yeah, they will. Be, because you got to realize in Ephesians 6, my mom and dad, my dad tell me this all the time. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it says, honor your father, shall father, and your mother, shall mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That's right. That it may be well with you. And here's the one they always throw at me. And you ain't going to live long if you don't honor me. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm still around. Come on. 33 twice. That's right. Well, well protective fathers, I wrote down their watchmen. Isn't that right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a daddy who was watching over me. Come on. Uh, a, a watchman over, they watch over their family. They're ready to attack the thief who's trying to break up their marriage and their home. And then I wrote down, he's ready. This daddy is, he's ready to do battle to defend his daughter for oncoming wolves. And, and you young girls will get that going on. The, the wolf is coming. Come on, somebody. And then I wrote down, he's also prepared. He's not just concerned and watching over his, his daughter. He's watching over that son. How many moms had to get on your knees and pray for that son? I got one right here praying twice for two. You see, because you want those sons and daughters to walk with God. I can tell you this daddy is prepared to take out a lion, watch, watch, or a lioness. Yes, because she's coming. I'm telling you, there's people that come in your children's life to take them out, and then there's people that come in their lives and your lives that are going to help you. I want you to give God praise for people that he brings to you that's going to help you and not destroy you. You see, responsible fathers know when they stand before God that they must give an account for their stewardship. That's right. A characteristic of a good, godly father and a man of God, he is a good steward. In other words, he don't waste what God has given him. He protects it and, and watches over it uh, because of all that God gave him and entrusted him with. Uh, he's to lead by example, and he knows one day he's going to stand before the Almighty God, and he's got to give account for everything that God has given him. Catch this. He wants to tell God, God, I still have everything you gave me. I got my wife, I got my sons, I got my daughters, I still got my health, I still got this, I got that, I'm still going to church, I'm still in the ministry. Oh, somebody give God a shout and a praise. God, I haven't lost anything. 
The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why we need Jesus. Oh, I said, that's why we need Jesus. Ain't no thief going to get my stuff. Come on now. Ain't no thief going to rob me. Ain't no thief going to take my family. I wish I had a man of God just jump up and say, Pastor, I'm with you. Come on, Roy, get on your feet. We'll go to battle with, oh, yes, we will. We're going to fight for our family. Oh, that, that's a responsible father. You see, Joshua 24, verse 15, I believe, says, as for me and my house. See, I can't talk about what you're doing at your house, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Give him a hallelujah in his house. Hey, hey, hey. I'm preaching up in here today. I feel the anointing here today. I feel the heavenly Father is here today. I feel Jesus walking in this place today. Is anybody else here know that he has showed up and he's walking up and down your aisle. He's about to lay a hand on your stuff and you're going to get a recovery. My, my, my. Yes, yes. Great fathers walk by faith that's right abraham was called the father of faith bible said he called things that were not as though they are <laughs> who been there got a t-shirt come on in other words i've spoke things and believed god for things sister ollie i never even saw but i felt in my spirit that god put a word there come on he said you're gonna start a church and i'm gonna draw them by my spirit people are gonna be saved you hear me preacher people are gonna be healed and delivered you're gonna have people singing and praising and worshiping the god that i am oh somebody shout amen and this church stepped out on faith, went into a little old abandoned schoolhouse, did phase two down the street and built a big building, 15,000 square feet, two and a half acres. Now God has allowed us to be here on the hot spot. We're a, we're a come on, we're not a not night light, we're the light of the city. We're a lighthouse. I'll raise your hand and give him glory. Makes me cry when I see people coming in the Father's doors. Means we got another opportunity to touch a life. Come on now. Great fathers walk by faith and not by sight. They trust their heavenly Father more than their own ability. Proverbs chapter 3, you know that verse, 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord. Say that with me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Lean not to your own understanding, and he shall direct thy paths. You ought to shout, I know that's right. You see, we have to trust him. We have to give him the burdens and the load. I'll get to that in a minute. You see, a good, great, responsible father, a godly father, he don't complain. I said a, a godly responsible father doesn't walk around every day in his house complaining well I'm tired of this and I'm tired of that now, you know what I'm tired of you too oh shut up <laughs> whining whining come on that's not a man of faith he's always the, well I, I don't know what I don't know what I'm gonna do that's why she got to say, don't worry, Junior, everything going to be all right. <laughs> Trying to go back to Mama's house. I got to go on. I'm messing with y'all now. All right, here we go. Here we go. Somebody say, we're going on. We're going on. You see, I remember when the 12 spies went into Canaan's land, the land of promise, and 10 out of 12, that must be at least 80%. Help me do math. Maybe 90. And only two of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, all the others said, we can't take this land. There's giants in the land, Frank. The devil's out here. Come on. Uh, we can't possess houses here and all this beautiful scenery and all these mountains and valleys. Well, I know God told us to come here, but it's just there are giants here. We can't do it. There's too many of them. And all the people... 
begin to be depressed. Well, we can't, we can't fight this corona. We can't, now this corona, biggest thing we ever seen. Well, I don't know how we gonna make it in the corona. We living in corona time. Y'all ain't shouting with me now, but I'm still preaching. I don't care what devil showed up. I still got a God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all things. And you ought to get rid of that spirit of fear. Come on, I didn't say use wisdom. Don't go stupid on God. God, but we ought to believe that God is able to protect us and I'm about to preach on the power of the blood does anybody believe there's power in the blood power to heal is in the blood power to deliver is in the blood who am I talking to that's watching today you need to know there's power in the name of Jesus and there's power in the name of God and he still on the throne now I gotta slow down cause I might wrinkle my new blue coat it's my father's day yeah. don't I look cute come on okay so watch this I gotta move on two men stood up Joshua and Caleb and your bible said they were men of another spirit shout faith they had the spirit of faith. They had God faith. They said, we're more than able. Come on, come on. I said, if they're stingy, come on. At 20, they're going to be stingy. At 40 and 60, cut them loose. Give God praise for wisdom in the house. You don't need to be dating somebody. They don't want to buy you a hamburger. That's ridiculous. You tell him you ain't going nowhere but the steakhouse. Come on, raise your hand if you're on that ship. Yeah, I got somebody. <laughs> yes, I wrote this down. And if that joker don't have a job, don't get me on somebody who won't work. I said, if that joker don't have a job, I don't care. Ladies, ladies, where's all my singles? Raise your hand if you're a single lady. Come on, get it. Don't be ashamed of it. Y'all be proud of it. Yeah, all my single ladies catch this, catch, catch this. I don't care how tall he is, how dark his hair is, how cute he is, how he struts his stuff. If he ain't got a job and you got to pay for the Coca-Cola, change your phone number, move somewhere across town, but cut that joker loose and run for your life. Give God another praise. <laughs> the apostle Paul said, he that don't work, don't eat. So don't be feeding him your burger. Come on. Proverbs declares, he that provideth not, now he's got to be married, he that provideth not for his own household is worse than an infidel. You know what the old timers used to call somebody that didn't have a job, that was trying to leech off of another woman's cash flow? They used to say, and I wrote this down, there's a lot of live trees standing in the forest, but dead wood lays on the ground. That's a good one. I made that up. I know I don't look like an old timer, but I'm just telling you that dead wood lays on the ground. <laughs> Yet I wrote down on the flip side, a real man of God. Somebody shout, there is a real man of God. A real man of God who's been born again has his heavenly father's DNA. That's right. God, listen, men, God, when he saved you, he put his DNA in you. That's right. And he made you to be a giver and not a taker. One of God's names, and I've already said it earlier, is Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. If he's your provider, give him another praise today. Now, I haven't got time. But I'll just throw it out there real quick because you ain't coming back tonight. You're going to the lake probably. Luke 15, that prodigal son, when the Bible said he came to his father and he, he, he was a taker, not a giver. 
And he said, I want my inheritance now. Well, Jewish customs was, you didn't get your father's inheritance, Brother Bobby, until the father died. But this young man was so stingy, felt like everybody owed him something. Are we not living in a generation that thinks they're entitled? Come on. You owe me, you owe me. I want free, I want free, I want free. Well, here's what I want to tell everybody that wants free. Get a job. So watch this. So here's the prodigal. He, he, he takes it. His father was so loving. Uh, he, Brother Gary, he gave it to him. I mean, I never read that in any Jewish story, but he gave it to him. The young man goes off. He lives a riotous life. He, he spends everything. Wasted on a life of sin. And then, Scripture says, he joined himself as a citizen of that faraway country because there was a famine. Things got tough. Now he's on the bottom. He ain't riding high on daddy's money. He's broke, he's busted, he's disgusted. He's working in a pig pen. And the Bible said he would have, uh, understand he said he would have ate the husk that the pigs ate. He's going to eat pig food. But the Bible said he came to himself. I love that. Don't you love that? There's grace right there. He came to himself. He didn't come to himself on his own. He was lost. He was blind. But he came to himself. God shined the light on him. How many is glad God shined the light on you in darkness? He shined the light and he came to himself. And the Bible said he started talking to himself. Have you ever been talking to yourself and driving down the road and somebody was passing you and they looked over and they saw you talking to yourself and you thought, oh, whoa, I better shut up. They'll call some 911. Come on. But I'm telling you, he was talking to himself. He says, how many hired servants does my father have? And they doing well, eating good, everything. He says, I'm going to rise and go back to my father's house. Amen. Scripture said he did just that. He got up, but I love this. On his way back. <laughs> His heavenly father. See, you might not have had an earthly father or even a good earthly father because maybe he didn't live for God. Maybe he was an alcoholic. Maybe he was in the drugs. Maybe he didn't even stick around when you were born. But let me share something with you. You always and always will have a heavenly father and he loves you more than you love yourself. He made you. You're not an accident. You have purpose and destiny and gifts and talents. And he's watching after you if you'll just listen. Watch this. He's, he's coming back home. And the Bible said that the father saw him. Amen. Might not anybody else see you, but your dad is watching you. Come on. He saw him. And it said that when he saw him afar off, he wasn't even on Smith Street. Come on. He wasn't even on Highway 77. He, wasn't, he was coming, and all of a sudden, his daddy saw him afar off, Brother Bobby, and Scripture said he ran. Brother Darren, my younger son sings that song, The Only Time I Ever Saw Daddy Run to Me. Or well, he does a good job. But I want to tell you something, that daddy, a type of the heavenly father, ran to him. And the scripture said that he throwed his arms around him and he hugged him and he kissed him. And then he spoke to his hired servants and said, bring him a robe that represented royalty. Come on. Bring him a, a ring and put it on his hand. That represented authority. Come on now. How I many knows God will restore you? Come on. Uh, with to authority. Power over all the power. Of him. And then he said, bring him some shoes, sandals. Put them on his feet. We're back in the shoe business. Come on. He's a partner with me. You see, what a beautiful story that no matter where you're going and how far you went, that God is always having your concern uh, in his heart and mind. Why? Because he's your provider. That's right. Uh, for you're saved by grace through faith, not that of yourself. It's a gift. Somebody shout it's a gift. All right, number three, point three, he should be a promoter. That's right. He should be a promoter. Somebody who will promote others 
instead of promoting themselves. Have you ever ran into somebody who's always saying, I did this, I did that, I did this? Huh? Sometimes I want to just stop and say, I wish you would. Come on. But they're always, they, it's all about them. Everything they do. I don't care what it is. Whether it's music, sports, singing, preaching, uh, business, uh, you know, whatever. They're always seemingly focusing on themselves. But a godly father will have this characteristic of our heavenly father. As a father, God has given, listen to me, men. God has given you talents, gifts, and abilities. That's right, I'm talking to the men and the fathers here. Young boys that'll be fathers. Izzy, God's given you gifts. Gabriel, God's given you gifts and talents. Y'all listen to pastor, right? Okay. I'm just trying to tell you, he's given us gifts and talents. Now, why did he give them to us? To be a blessing to others. Come on. And if you're going to be a godly father, God wants you to stop looking and concerning about yourself. He wants you to take your gifts and your talents and your abilities. Brother Louis, teach that son how to work. Teach that son how to be protective. Teach that son how to talk to his mama. Teach that son how to be honest. Come on, raise your hand in here, man. Teach him to do right. Walk right. Talk right. Am I right about it? And, and, and as you're developing him in his skills and abilities, come on now, investing in your son or daughter will take your time, your money, and watch this, and your prayer. Nobody going to raise godly children without spending time on their knees in prayer. Come on, give God a praise in the house. You see, God wants you to help somebody bloom where they're at. And God has given you the ability and the talents to invest in your children. Sister Holly, how many are investing in your grandchildren? Raise your hand. You might as well because that dad or mom might not be. Maybe they're not saved. And it's because of your prayers and what you do to help them is pointing them in the right direction. I got a granddaughter Darren's little, one of my many, she's always texting me every now and then, sending a picture of, of the past, of family getting together. And she always puts those words. Hello, Papa. It's all about family. Come on. Even a 12-year-old, a nearly 13, going on 23, she even knows the value of family. Come on, give our children a praise offering. They get it. My wife has always been teaching our kids. I thought about her yesterday when I was studying, tears coming down my eyes. Why? Because many times at 20, I think I started ministering at 27, we started a singing group, probably about 24, when I was 24. Got married at 23, so here we were going. But, but we jumped right out there in evangelism. And our children, Darren, Brandon, Shay, they were raised on the platform in church after church, Brother Louie. On Fridays, when I got through working as a paint contractor, Brother Ernest, I'd run home. I mean, I worked hard. Six days a week, a lot of time. But if we had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday revival all the way in Tyler, I had to run home, man, jump out of there, get a, get a shower, get clothes on, load the piano, the keyboard, the drums. We, we did the bass. We did it all. And I'd get out, and then you had, you, you had Brandon, you know, by then he was 10 to 12, and Shay, she was, I remember, six, five, it didn't matter. They were all growing, stair-stepping, and, and, and their mom, when we was in the house, I, I would want her to play my song. I needed to sing. And, and I watched her as she, I thought of this yesterday, she would focus on the kids. Are you hearing me, Daddy? She, she focused on them. Oh, Dan, five years old, we gave him a Snickers candy bar. Took him into a studio and he sung his first song, first take. I said, son, if you'll sing this thing, first take. I said, it's costing Daddy money. I'll give you a Snicker. 
He went in there and got up there and he sung that song, I got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Did it on the first take. That's what a snicker will do for your son. But she always recognized, and she would tell me, we need, to, we need to take time to teach them and invest in them. And, and, and it stuck over the years. And then it was just amazing as we watched Shay begin to teach and then preach. Brandon playing drums. He would play bass a little bit. He sang. They did the trio. Then Darren would do the solos and... I think he grouped up with them sometime. But it's a blessing. There's nothing that a father probably cherishes than seeing his children and then his grandchildren living and working for God with gifts that God put in them. Come on, give God praise for them. <laughs> so point number four. I got to get out of here quick. I know it's, here we go. He should be the priest of his home. The God in your Bible, he's always declared himself to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he was never Isaac's God until Isaac became a man. He was the God of Abraham. And he was not the God of Isaac until that time. Only when Isaac became a man. And I wrote down, it takes a process to develop a young boy into manhood. Can I get an amen from the ladies? That's why after the flood, the first thing Noah did when he got off the boat, he built an altar and he prayed unto God. You can't just come to church, man, and not have a prayer life. I'm challenging every man in this house. If you do, you'll flip out with what life throws at you. You've got too much to worry about without having the ability to put it in God's hands. You got to trust God. You got to be able to turn everything that comes your way to God. As a matter of fact, you're not only the priest, you're the head of the family. And some people wonder what's coming at dad. Well, sometimes dad don't tell the rest of them what's going on. You don't go home and bring work at home. You come home to be with family. Leave work at work. Can I get an amen there? And you need to be able to catch the wind and the storm that's coming spiritually. And your son, your daughter, your wife, your family, your marriage. I talked to somebody earlier this week that was struggling in some areas of marriage. I don't know if they're here today, but let me tell you. And I told them, you just keep standing on the word of God and praying and believing God and fight the good fight of faith. And don't let any devil mess with your marriage or your family. God puts you as the priest. Noah got off that boat, built an altar. Men, we have to have an altar of prayer. We can't just pray on Sunday morning. You have to live a life of prayer. That's what's going to make you be what God wants you to be as a husband and a father. Jesus said, you can't carry it all. In Matthew, he said, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. That's right. All the trouble of your kids, all the trouble of money, all the trouble of the bills, all the trouble of your work, all the troubles on the job, all the troubles you face day in and day out. So I want to ask somebody right now, where are the men of prayer? Because if you're going to have a strong church, we need men of prayer. The women always praying, but we need men to be prayer warriors and priests of their home. Give God a shout. In other words, if you're a prayer warrior, you're a fighter. Come on. Paul said, fight for the good fight. Fight the good fight of faith. That's right. So I need somebody who's going to be a prayer warrior to shout out to the devil. Devil, you ain't getting my family and the Bible said men ought to lift up holy hands and pray without ceasing. My question to you is, do you know why men are to lift up holy hands under God without ceasing and pray without ceasing? 
It's because you're going to have trouble coming at you 24-7, 365 days a week. Watch this. Without ceasing. The enemy's going to fight you because his job is to take you out. I'm going to point number five and we're closing. Yes, but I wrote down. When you're going through problems and troubles coming without ceasing, when trouble comes, give it to God. When sickness comes, give it to God. When heartaches come, give it to God. Because if you don't, you're going to collapse. You weren't built to carry the load. Jesus said, come unto me, ye that are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, not the yoke of trouble. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And God is a present help in the time of trouble. Shout up in this house today. I got to go. Point number five. A great father, this is short, prophesies. Say that with me. Prophesies. I say it all the time. Faith is nigh in your mouth. Death and life in the power of the tongue. You have not because you ask not. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you'll have them. So a, a, a father that will prophesy over his children, his grandchildren, his family, his marriage, his home, you have to prophesy. Yes, you have to prophesy to your children who they are, what they can do, what they're going to, and it even speaks of their destiny. Sometimes you've got to preach to your kids. Now, I'm just going to tell this. Rachel was given birth. Her second child, husband named Jacob, they were traveling on a journey Jacob must have been in the background or he could have been in the front of the caravan. But all of a sudden, the birth pains got so great and the midwife that was working with her did all she could do. But as this son was birthed, she, she died. But before she died, she named that son Benoni. And when Jacob climbed up in the wagon, and the nurse said, she's dead, Jacob. Well, he wept, no doubt. And the baby was crying as she gave him into the arms of his father. And right there, Jacob, a man of faith, a godly father, one who prophesies over his children. He said, no, no, no. You're not going to name this boy Benoni, son of my sorrows. See, I'm talking to somebody right now that maybe your daddy said some things to you. I remember, I love my daddy, but I wasn't his favorite of six kids. But I remember one time when I was about 12 years old. He wasn't a man much of conversation, but he, he got mad at me for something. And he raised his voice at me a little bit as I was taking the trash to the back. And Brother Bobby, he said, you're probably going to grow up to be somebody lazy. And you're going to be big and fat. And you're you're probably going to beat your wife. I never forgot that. The only reason I shared that is not because I don't love my daddy. I love my daddy. He was human. He did his best. Born in 1916. Be well over 100 years today if he'd have lived. Lived to be 82 years old. Made a bad choice one time after 28 years and left my mama. She stayed in Waco. That's where I, 17 years old, I came to Waco. No job, no place to stay. But I had God. And all I can tell you is, I shared that to let you know 
maybe you're here today and somebody spoke some words over you that you'll never be any good. You'll never amount to anything. You'll, you'll be just like your daddy. You'll be a drug addict. You'll be like your mama. You'll, you'll be a prostitute. You'll be in one marriage out of the other. You'll never amount to anything. Well, you ain't nothing. But I come to tell you today, it doesn't matter what somebody tries to put on you as a label. God said you're mine and I knew you before you were born and he prophesied that your best days are ahead don't give up do what Jacob did he said he will not be my son of sorrow I don't care what she said in her time of misery Rachel was a good woman she was in pain and a lot of people said things they shouldn't have said but all of a sudden he said you shall be called Benjamin whose name means you will be the son of my right hand you will be my power you will be my strength come on and stand on your feet today put your hands together and give your God Abba Father a praise offering in his house you're in your father's house today he loves you he cares about you